so yeah, this talk is about, uh, it's actually the Triforce of uh, Rust game dev and open source. But uh, we'll get to that later. So this is a bit of an overview. Uh, going to go briefly through a high level kind of thing of what game dev is for those who may not be familiar. Uh, go a little bit more in depth about uh, why we chose Rust and from the open source perspective. Uh, and then talk about using open source, hurdles with using open source, uh, collaborating on open source, and uh, hurdles. Uh, so this is a little bit about me. I've been working in game dev for almost 13 years now. Um, and I've worked at uh, two middling sized companies of like under 150 people. Um, and then I was at uh, Frostbite in EA for uh, many years, and they're quite huge. And then now I'm at Embark Studios working on Rust, and we're small but fierce. <laughs> um, and so, so kind of a disclaimer, like a lot of the things I'm going to say about game dev are like my opinions that I've formed over the course of my uh, work experience. And this is like, I would say typical of game dev, but it's not necessarily going to be true for all game dev. There's a lot of uh, differences because game dev is a huge um, industry. So there's, there's the things I say will not apply to everything. Uh, so quickly, we're going to go through some stuff with this. So, so these are kind of the, the typical pieces of, uh, uh, that you'll find in games. i um, not going to talk about server and services because they're kind of all the scope, uh, but the other pieces are quite relevant. So, so the main kind of piece is the, the engine, and this is like where the platform distractions are, where um, this could be considered like the standard of game dev in the sense that it's where uh, the platform distractions are so that the games can be easily uh, ported to multiple platforms and, and all that kind of stuff, and it's where uh, middleware integrations happen, and it is an occasional user of open source. Uh, a typical example would be like compression. Uh, uh, tools. So, so when you're building a game, uh, there's a ton of content uh, in, in current games that you need to actually get into uh, the game. And so this takes GUI tools and importers and exporters from uh, you know 3D packages and audio software. And there's just like a whole kind of range of things that users of games uh, or players never see, but that is part of the making of the games. And uh, this is typically a mixture of languages, not just C++. Uh, and they're usually Windows specific, but not always. And then there's the actual uh, game itself. Uh, so this is like the very unique code that makes up a game. It's an infrequent user of open source because it's typically like custom code that like only applies to one game, so it's not really applicable uh, to a lot of general use cases. Um, so yeah. So so kind of in a summary, like open source is used in game dev uh, quite a bit, uh, especially in tools, um, and then but like kind of all the things in game dev for the most part are closed source. But like I get said. That's only typical. There are a lot of good stuff out there as well. Uh, so now we get to why Rust. Um, so our CTO is speaking again. Uh, this is from a blog post. Uh, and he basically calls out that one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why we chose Rust is, yeah, the language is great and all that kind of stuff. But actually, part of the greatness of it is the open source nature of it, both from the language and tooling perspective, and then also the huge amount of open source code that people have published in Rust. Um, and so th the reason why Rust and open source is such a good combo is because and it, uh, it makes open source easier to use, easier to publish, and easier to collaborate on. And we'll get more into that later. Uh, so, so yeah, quick aside. Uh, uh, we're, just, we're saying open source is good and everything, but obviously people want to create their own stuff. You wouldn't be a programmer otherwise. Um, so, so given that you're not going to write everything, though, uh, yourself, you're typically going to use open source to do it. But obviously, you're going to write a lot of your own code. So, so now we're getting into using open source. So, so the first thing you do with C and C++ when you use an open source package is first you have to get it. 
Um, and this is where the kind of the first friction comes in, because Rust, uh, so C++ has uh, a really hard time actually just getting code for the most part. There are package managers out there, but they're not um, widely used. And uh, typically what game, games do is they will take an open source package, uh, put it into their own private source control, uh, and then break the connection with the, the actual source of truth that the, the code originally came from. And this immediately starts getting into the problems of uh, up changes not being upstreamed, and then actual changes happening to the code in their internal repository that actually ends up making it harder to bring in improvements in the original, uh, from the original repository in the future. Uh, Rust is a little bit simpler. Uh, you add one line to a file, and then you get the code. And that's about it. Uh, but we also do have vendoring. So, so previously, this is a separate tool, uh, but actually is now built into, into Cargo itself, uh, where you can just vendor all of uh, a package and all of its translative dependencies into a local directory. And then you can put it in your source control or, or whatever you want to do. Uh, there are use cases for it, but uh, this is not the typical workflow. It just does support it as well, natively. Uh, so once you get the code, you have to build it. Uh, and C++ makes this uh, annoying. Um, so, so the first thing you have to do is actually get it to work in your build system, which is uh, sometimes minutes, sometimes hours, sometimes days of work, depending on how complex the, the project is. Uh, and then the other problem is that a lot of the open source code out there uh, is very Linux focused. Um, and if it supports multiple platforms other than Linux, it may not support them well. Um, and so you typically have to fix things like MSVC warnings because no one has compiled it on MSVC in years or ever. Uh, and then you ha have to do something uh, usually for, like if you're using this code on the PS4 or Xbox One or any kind of proprietary platform that doesn't have a publicly available S SDK that uh, most developers don't have access to, then you have to go in and fix the syscalls. And the asterisk there is because the same problem exists for Rust, but it's actually worse for Rust because uh, Rust doesn't have a SDK for the PS4. It's a C++ one that then has to be wrapped. And then you can't open source that part because Sunnis will sue you. Uh, so building in Rust is uh, actually the same thing because once you have it, you can also build it. So done with that. Um, and then, and then, actually, you know, once you have the code, once you've actually built the code, you actually have to use the code in your code base because presumably you've done all this work to actually use it. Um, and that's really, really hard because C++ is like a huge language with a ton of history, and because it's uh, so big and there's so many different revisions of it, uh, it's just really, really hard to to decide on how to write an API, for example, um, and because of this, it's it's not trivial uh, often to actually just use a C++ library. So usually what happens is you have a C, C library, which is way easier to use, but you still have to wrap it. Um, you have to protect kind of the rest of your code base from it uh, because you don't know what it's doing and you want to prevent improper usage. So this is a bit of a controversial opinion, but in my opinion, Rust is a small language uh, as it, it like skews more towards C than C++ in terms of size and complexity. Obviously, it's a lot more complicated than C, but um, I think it's way less complicated than C++. And uh, one of the kind of core concepts in it is traits. And uh, traits are a way for libraries to com communicate with each, other, with each other without having to be tightly integrated and coupled together. And I think this is a real strength of Rust uh, that makes it really, really easy to consume other people's code or, or um, vice versa. It also has all kinds of great code generation and a strong standard library and a lot of other great things that make it quite easy, easier. Uh, so this is a simple example program that I wrote for this talk. Um, so this is doing a, a command line argument parsing. Uh, and it's doing it with a lot of complex code they don't see that actually gets boiled down to basically two, two lines. Um, and yeah, so hello, Stockholm Rust Meetup. So 
so I talked a little about like technical issues with with actually using open source, um, but there's a lot of problems with using it that in in game dev specifically, and I think probably in other industries that are um, not really technically related. Um, and the big one is licensing. So so game dev has like a, a fear uh, of uh, external code, particularly because of licenses, and particularly because of things like GPL and copyleft licenses, um, because uh, GPL and how copyleft works is like if that code ever gets into a game that goes to users, then the entire rest of the code also has to be open sourced. So, so companies are very, very uh, paranoid about that happening. And so, so what happens is companies will develop processes around this where they'll do things like have licensing portals or uh, approvals from your manager or all this kind of manual process to, to go through to actually be able to use open source in the first place. And uh, it, it's, it's a problem, but it's actually not as big of a problem for C++, C++ because as we've gone through, it's kind of annoying to actually get it in the first place. So having a manual process to get approval to do it anyway isn't really that big of a deal because you're already spending a ton of time on it, so it's not really an issue. But for, for Rust, it is an issue because it's so easy to do. You kind of have to have a, a not manual process. Um, and so, so Rust does have, in Cargo, have um, metadata associated with what licensing requirements uh, the crate has. And so in this example, we just said MIT or BSD2. Uh, and so, great, we have the metadata, but that doesn't really help us because you still have to look at it. Uh, so this is where one of our open source tools comes in. Uh, so this is Cargo and I. It's our dependency gardening tool. Uh, we use it to kind of maintain our crate graph over time. And uh, it's open source. Uh, you can go on GitHub and, and look at it or uh, install it. Uh, and basically, uh, s the top kind of goals of it is uh, ensure that all the crates that we use have proper licensing uh, and keep certain crates over our dependency graph because we don't like them. And then also detects duplicates, which is important for build times. Uh, so in this case, uh, this is the, the config, so if you remember, I had it as MIT or BSD2, uh, and then we're also using some transitive dependencies. So here, because we haven't allowed any licenses, every license is going to be a problem, and it's just saying, like, I detected this license and you didn't meet any of the requirements, so I'm going to actually fail. Uh, so another reason that you don't use open source is uh, financial reasons, and companies like to buy software because if you buy software, you tend to have support agreements and contracts and agreements, and there's legal stuff, and people like paying for stuff, and, and we do too, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it's a weird thing to say uh, that people would rather you pay for something than get it for free, but uh, that does happen. Uh, and this is an open problem in open source. Um, there's a lot of options. There's uh, so so this is a from our embark.dev website. So we have a Patreon, a GitHub uh, sponsorship, an open collective. Uh, we're directly funding specific individuals. We're funding. Uh, uh, oh yeah. Uh, today we sponsored Blender, the Blender Foundation, which is a 3D software package for modeling and, and a lot of other stuff. Um, but it's, a, it's an issue that we're, we're working uh, with a lot of people to figure out what the best way forward is here, because open source in general is kind of having this problem, I think, right now. Um, and it's something that uh, we're interested in helping, helping with. So, so we got past the, the using open source. Uh, how do you actually collaborate on open source? Um, so, so C++. Uh, Again, we get to the problem of uh, everyone says like C and C++ is portable, particularly C, like C runs everywhere. Uh, great, uh, except uh, if you aren't on the proper platform and you don't have the proper compiler and you don't have the proper uh, tool chain, uh, it kind of quickly gets complicated. And then again, with the C++, there's so many versions of it. Uh, people disagree on which ones you should support, and then if you're on, uh, say, one particular compiler that always lags behind on C++ uh, um, standardization, then you can't use certain libraries because they've upgraded and your compiler doesn't support it yet. 
and then again with the countless build systems, uh, because there's just there's so many build systems, it's ridiculous. Um, so, so Rust is a much, much simpler story. Uh, it has one compiler, uh, several linkers, um, and uh, one kind of build system. And the reason there's an asterisk to all these is because uh, Rust makes it really, really easy to consume uh, C, uh, particularly C, but also C++ code, uh, as we'll get to later. Um, and uh, but as soon as you have C and C++ code, all of a sudden, all these like nice guarantees that Rust, like you can just download something and use it, kind of start going away because all of a sudden, oh, I have to have a proper C++ compiler. Oh, I'm linking against a system dependency that may or may not be on the the system, and so all of a sudden you get into more complicated scenarios uh, because of C and C++. So hopefully, in the long term, uh, there will be less of that code in the future, so that we'll have fewer problems. Um, uh, and, then, and then we get to the problem of just like code quality. It's really hard to collaborate when you have to fight with uh, people giving you PRs or you sending PRs to someone else, and you have wildly varying opinions on how to write good C and C++ code and if it's safe or not. Uh, and you know, if you're on, uh, say, Windows and you don't have a access to things like Cache Grind or Val Grind or all, all the kind of nice tooling for finding uh, some of these issues, but someone else does and you don't know about it, and all of a sudden you're having an argument, uh, there's there's just so so many problems with keeping C and C++ in a in a nice way that you can actually push it to people or get patches from them. Um, I think Rust significantly reduces the friction uh, across all these areas. Um, the biggest one would be the language guarantees that you get from just the safety aspect. Um, but then also there's just like a massive amount of tooling uh, that, that Rust has created, uh, both just for Rust, but also just wrapping things that C and C++ already have, such as fuzzers. Uh, so the first one, so so just made a small change to our, our program and just moved the printing to another thread uh, to make it faster. Uh, so yeah, this you know really really good code, uh, way way faster, uh, but it's also broken. Um, and Rust tells us that immediately, um, and this gets. This is really, really hard in C++ because you don't really have any kind of guarantees from a language level that uh, your code is thread safe and that it's going to stay thread safe for the future. And then there's obviously tests. Uh, like having a built-in testing framework is it's very basic, but it gets the job done. And uh, just having it is just it's so nice to be able to really easily say, did they break the test or did I break the test? Um, and just makes yeah, PRs and all this kind of stuff just vastly easier when you have something built in that you can just trust and rely on. And there's just like so many other ways that Rust reduce Rust and the Rust ecosystem reduces friction. Uh, there's too many things to talk about, but there's you know, uh, yeah, there's just so many good things. Um, yeah, like DocsRS, like every single publicly published crate has document full documentation generated from the source code that is also. Uh, checked against the compiler to make sure that your example code actually compiles like it's insane uh, and then and then there's just like the standard tooling that is kind of pervasive in the rust ecosystem which is uh, one of them is rust format so I really hate talking about code style because it's to me it's very very boring and pointless but people have really strong opinions about it uh, so we just remove the opinion from it and say whatever Rust format says is how we accept PRs or not. Like if if you keep the same style, then we don't care. Uh, Clippy, uh, Clippy is just like a way to find just a lot of just simple low hanging fruit that just cleans up your code base, uh, reduces like s simple performance issues. Um, and just makes your code cleaner and nicer, and it's a great way for people to learn Rust because they can just run Clippy on a project and say, oh, you have this little thing and I can fix it. Uh, and then uh, another feature of Cargo and I was, uh, yeah, we really, really dislike OpenSSL, um, so we remove it from all of our, pro make sure it never comes into any of our projects. Uh, so yeah, we, we keep our code clean from OpenSSL. Uh, so, 
so as said before, we had the hurdles for using open source. Now there's also the hurdles for collaboration. Uh, so the biggest one is obviously just like collaboration is hard. All of a sudden you're talking with people uh, from other companies that may have differing opinions on priorities and uh, what they feel is important. Um, and, and it's really, really hard. It's both hard open sourcing your own things because other people get to see your code, which is maybe not good. Uh, and then, and then, like just talking with people that you don't have a um, relationship with, that are, may live across the world, is is very, very difficult. Um, and I think, particularly in game dev communities uh, or companies, um, open source is considered kind of a, a zero sum game or even a negative sum game. Um, and like it's really hard to just get something open source, or um, make a case. Like you often have to make a business case for it. So, so for example, if a company was to have their own internal version of the standard template library for for C plus plus, and they wanted to open source it, they may have to prove it uh, as a worthy thing to do by making a case that they could influence the standard committee, for example. Uh, and then also, a lot of people just think that their code is the best thing ever, and uh, I worked really hard on it, so why would I let other people see it and use it? Which is a weird argument if you're a programmer, in my opinion. Uh, and and kind of we we disagree, obviously. Like uh, it's a lot of hard work, but it's worth it. Uh, so for example, this was a, a PR that we get that we got. I think like two days after we open sourced this texture synthesis crate, which uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I really recommend you check it out. It's like really really cool, and it's written by a, a, a one of our employees that she's like kind of a Rust noob, and she was able to to make a awesome Rust crate that was really cool. It has like 700 stars. Um, but yeah, we got this like two days later, and then improved the performance by 50 percent. Cool. Uh, to, so to summarize, so so right now uh, we have our main Rust project, uh, and it, and ha uses about 411 open source crates. Um, we like a, like uh, Yohan mentioned, we've open sourced uh, nine crates now. Uh, we've contributed uh, issues, pull requests, um, yeah, all kinds of stuff to a lot of crates. Most of them are just bumping dependencies, but some of them are bug fixes and, and so forth. Uh, and we're also yeah helping sponsor and fund several people and projects like Rust Analyzer, for example, um, because we really want to invest more in open source, whether that's uh, collaborating uh, just on code or paying people. Um, so so yeah, so so Rust just for us simplifies uh, contributing using open source. Like really before this, I don't think really any of us had really been involved that much in the open source community because it was just hard and we worked at companies that were kind of like antithetical to to how open source is, works. Um, but but yeah, the, the combination of Rust and open source and game dev is just like a really great combination and even without Rust. Uh, that's a blog post by one of our DevOps uh, engineers talking about uh, other ways we use open source. So yeah, it's the Triforce. So. <laughs> How am I on time? Yeah, you have a few quick questions, I think. Yeah. Questions we ate? No. So, uh, what do you miss in the C++ interface? Uh, I don't know. Is that a trick question? <laughs> uh, what do I miss? Um, so, I, th I think, like I said, like there's actually a lot of the good parts of C++ and the C++ and C ecosystems, like uh, really good fuzzers, really good um, stack analyzers and stuff like that, you can still use from Rust. So, and like same thing with uh, debuggers and there, like a lot of the tooling and, and then uh, like, yeah, LLVM is kind of the, the reason why Rust can target a lot of things. So it's like the improvements that the Clang team makes to LLVM to improve their code improves Rust as well, so. Do we have a? Do we have another question? Uh, 
Yeah, I voice. Are there things in the scripture that uh, yeah, so the talk after mine will go way further in depth than you want on that. <laughs> but yeah, like I I mean I would say our ultimate goal is to rid our entire code base of all C and C++ as much as possible. Um, uh, like one reason why we really dislike OpenSSL is because OpenSSL has system dependencies that are fine on Linux and Mac, but are problematic on Windows. Uh, so we just use uh, Rust LS, and uh, yeah, it it makes it so that yeah, so it's it's ASM and C, but it's fine because it's in a nice Rust package that's primarily used from Rust, so uh, we don't have way fewer problems with it than OpenSSL. Awesome. Is a quick question? Uh, what kind of bad change? Okay, yeah, so so we definitely gloss over some of the, the, the problems with Rust because like so so Rust like makes getting dependencies really, really easy. And there's a thing called builder S, which means it'll like it can do anything it wants. So most people use it for building C or uh, downloading a Git repo to then compile it or, or something like that. But it can also just like take your SSH keys and upload them somewhere. Uh, and nothing really stops that. And so that is a, a problem that like everyone's aware of, but no one has a clear fix yet. But there's like some really promising things. Uh, there's a, a really cool thing that just got open source called Watt, which is Web Assembly something something. Uh, but it's basically um, procedural macros or a way that you can generate code and, and do all kinds of compile time transformations with code. And what they he actually did was put it into Wasm so that all of a sudden the, the procedural macros are sandboxed and they can't actually access the system because like normally they can just like write files or read files or do whatever they want. Uh, but now it can only act, interact via Wasm so it actually makes it safe. Uh, so if the procedural macros can do that and become official and then they can do the same thing for build RS, that would actually be really great. But uh, there's no plans for that any time in the near term as far as I'm aware. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Jake, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, let's another round of applause for Jake. Yeah.